Warning. This video will feature zero spoilers or discussion of The Last of Us Part 2. It will, however, go into major spoilers for the first game. And my choice for the number one best game of the decade, The Last of Us. Naughty Dog's swan song to the seventh generation is a somber dive into the human experience. This lead-in sentence to my emotional appeal for the game's worth carries a significant purpose. On the surface, you can neatly divide the world of The Last of Us into two categories, the mindless infected and the final remnants of humanity. In this world, there are two options. You either die humanity intact, or live long enough to see yourself become infected. The creeping fear of the latter fate is what tests the former. Against an unrelenting bombardment of life or death decisions, how long can you maintain your humanity? This is what makes the characters of the game so fascinating. Take a person with predefined personality traits, skills, and sensibilities, then throw them to the metaphorical infected wolves to see how they respond. As they're faced with mortal dangers, those who survive are forever changed. Their preconceived notions of morality are stripped away by unsavory actions necessary to survive. And in some cases, people go beyond the bare necessities in favor of what they want. The burden of these selfish desires is immense in a cruel world with no room for compromise. These decisions reveal the true natures of The Last of Us. Today, I'd like to take a look into these personal truths for the main protagonists, Joel and Ellie. I'll define their baseline qualities, how these traits are shaped by their journey, what their actions throughout say about their character, and use these elements to understand the nature of their relationship built through their grim adventure. We have the advantage of learning a bit about Joel as the outbreak begins. From the introduction, we can discern a handful of details about him. He is struggling to provide financially for his family. He cares deeply for his daughter, Sarah. He is patient with his neighbors, but will protect his own without question when pushed. And he will forgo helping others if he thinks it adds additional risk. As the world begins to crumble, his flight or fight response kicks in and demands a single action. Get Sarah to safety. This becomes more complicated as they get T-boned, leading to a leg injury that prevents her from walking. Joel frantically makes his way through the crowd, Sarah in tow, desperately looking for an escape route. Tommy secures one for him, a path blocked by a soldier with orders to contain the infection at all costs. Carrying out his duty, he fires on Joel and Sarah, stopped by Tommy mere seconds before executing Joel. Sarah isn't so lucky. She's caught in the crossfire, her life fading away after a few pained screams. Though the initial moments tell us a bit about Joel, this moment speaks volumes. As he cradles her lifeless body begging for a different fate, his overwhelming grief is extended into the player. Not a dry eye in the house is putting it lightly. An overwhelming sadness cuts deep, extending a flood of sympathy to Joel in response. The prologue serves to frame our feelings toward Joel in a desired way from the start. It creates a great concern and curiosity for the state of his character as we cut 20 years ahead. Let's revisit the four traits I noted earlier and see how they hold up after the time skip. Joel struggles to provide financially under normal circumstances. It seems in this harsh reality that he's carved out greater success. His newfound depth of resources is founded on a pile of misdeeds. From peddling pills to hunting down a small-time criminal for a bounty of guns, Joel's moral compass is shattered from the very start. He and his partner Tess kill a dozen men without hesitation. Also, they can torture their leader and ascertain the whereabouts of a shipment of guns they'd like to profit off of. Weapons likely to fuel the Firefly's rebellious war against the martial law they live under. Joel's protect-his-own mentality has shifted to securing what he wants, a whim that is still bound to his disdain for taking unnecessary risk. Such a risk is introduced quickly as the Fireflies take ownership of the guns they seek and agree to exchange them if they are willing to escort a certain VIP. Unlike Joel, we learn little to nothing about Ellie as she's introduced. Effectively cargo for him to transport, the only important detail revealed about her in the initial hour is her immunity. She is the first gleam of hope we encounter, but this hope is built on tragedy. Forfeited at birth by her mother to Marlene, the leader of the Fireflies who negotiates her safe passage in the future, Ellie is offloaded to a military boarding school at a young age. There she meets Riley, a close friend who she slowly falls for. Riley eventually leaves to join the Fireflies, but returns 45 days later to take Ellie on an impromptu date through a worn down mall. Their time together reveals a lot about Ellie's character. She's very social and cares deeply for those she becomes close to. She's been hurt repeatedly by those people abandoning her, either through choice or death. She enjoys bringing positivity and levity through playfulness, banter, and cracking bad jokes. She isn't afraid to be vulnerable if she thinks it will mean something. 
and she's skilled in lethal combat, but uses it as a last resort when cornered. Throughout their magical night, Ellie expresses her disappointment in Riley abandoning her, while also expressing empathy for Riley's concerns about her role as a firefly. She listens intently and puts herself out there. She takes risks to develop a relationship. When their climactic moment is cut short by a sudden infected ambush, Ellie responds well with only a knife and her two feet running beneath her. Despite their attempts to escape, they are both bitten. Riley proposes two choices, take the easy way out or make the most of the time they have left until they lose their minds together. She says that this whole life has been fighting for each moment we get to spend with those we love, so why waste what time they have left? And so they choose to fight, as hopeless as their efforts may seem. With Ellie's resolve centered on fighting for more time to spend with those she loves, it casts an opposing curiosity on what keeps Joel going. He's managed to survive for 20 years. In a world like this, that doesn't come with that sacrifice. The ultimate toll a parent can pay is levied against him from the very start. The resulting grief is unfathomable. What we can determine is that in spite of this grief, his resolve centered around a hardened goal, survival. There is no way he would make it as long as he did without being resolute in this aim. This is made clear by the conversations with Ellie and Tommy. To Ellie, he admits that in the past, he murdered other survivors in pursuit of their resources. A twisted combination of his earlier traits, he will provide for his own above all else. Tommy later relates this in a heated moment to Joel about how nightmarish the early days were in response to Joel's claim that he kept him alive. At what cost? The different answers to this question is what defines humanity among the last of us. Consider this moment where we observe hunters slaughter a couple without mercy, then balk at the woman they just stole life from for not having anything of value for them. They killed her for nothing and resent her for lacking what they deem is worth. In their eyes, that's how little the life of a stranger matters in this world. Joel is no different. If you're unwilling to believe his past actions were similar, consider the events in Boston. Tess comes home from a deal with ration cards worth months of supplies. Instead of accepting this boon as enough, they immediately set out to claim their bounty of guns from Robert. They mercilessly slaughter his men in that pursuit, even though they gave them equal opportunity to leave. I understand Robert intercepted this bounty that was intended for them, but they choose in a state of relative comfort to snuff out lives for more. This hunt that feels uncomfortably routine proves fruitless, as Robert sold the guns to the Fireflies. This is the catalyst for their trade. Marlene agrees to give them the weapons in exchange for transporting Ellie to the Boston capital. Forgive me for the lengthy exposition, but it illustrates a necessary point. Joel is a morally bankrupt monster that will stop at nothing to survive at his standard of comfort. This is his starting point as he meets Ellie, an escort mission he takes on only for personal gain. As you see him interact with someone other than Tess, you quickly see how emotionally constipated he is. He treats Ellie as incompetent baggage not worthy of trust, especially when he finds out she's infected and allegedly immune. A dynamic that becomes dramatically more complicated once the escort drop off is compromised, a realization that forces Tess to reveal she was bitten on the trip. As the militia closes in, Joel is robbed of control. He's forced to leave Tess to a quick death instead of succumbing to infection. Her last stand buys him enough time to get away, but leaves him exiled from his comforts in Boston, with an unavoidable response Responsibility. With no other option, Joel agrees to take Ellie to his brother who knows the Fireflies. There are numerous pivotal moments that follow, but their importance to Ellie and Joel's character arcs differs dramatically. Until they reach Tommy's, Joel continues to treat Ellie with a distant disdain. The experiences they do share build a slow bond between them, but it doesn't stop Joel from trying to rid his hands of her upon reaching Tommy. He asks his younger brother, who has his own community relying on him, including his wife, to up and leave and cross the infected wilds to deliver the girl with a neat bow to the fireflies as if it doesn't matter to him. And he does it knowing that her immunity will be too enticing for his altruistic brother to pass up. He manipulates him so he can go back to caring for himself only. But it's too late. In an emotional confrontation, Ellie calls out Joel for being too afraid to admit he's scared of losing her, and asserts that she's not Sarah. Oh no, you hit the Sarah button. This is the turning point for their relationship. Ellie's willingness to be vulnerable and force Joel to do the same leaves his pent-up grief exposed. He can either admit that he's grown fond of Ellie and stay by her side until the missions end, or can keep lying to himself. 
While not terribly clear why initially, he chooses the honest route and takes Ellie toward the Fireflies himself. The immediate change in their rapport suggests that the reason is Joel's admiration for Ellie. He's far more friendly and conversational with her. He even discusses slight details about Sarah and his ex-wife, which is huge for him. He starts opening up for the first time in over two decades. As they find out the Fireflies have abandoned the university for a distant hospital, they're attacked by bandits. For the first time, Joel fails to fend them off and has to rely on Ellie to survive. This is yet another key moment. Throughout the escape, Ellie puts her life on the line to save him. He sees Death Flash before him on multiple occasions before Ellie swoops in. And as he falls severely ill from his injury, Ellie continues this pattern. She fights through a mall for medical supplies to suture the wounds, she hunts for food to sustain them, she bargains with imposing strangers for antibiotics, ultimately resulting in her capture. You know what Joel loves more than anything? His survival. If there was any doubt about his adoration for Ellie, it's solidified by this experience. This is made abundantly clear when he wakes up to find her missing and carves a merciless path of blood to reach her. At first, the bandits are trying to kill him, but he eventually pursues them like a bloodthirsty madman as they run away. He tortures two of them with an ice cold demeanor like it's a leisurely stroll through their waking nightmares. He fights his way to Ellie, and he finds her alive. He embraces her with the soothing words, baby girl, a term of endearment previously reserved for Sarah. Despite this attempt at comfort, Ellie's spirit begins to crack. Imagine being abandoned by everyone you held dear for 14 years. Then one of those people returned. You forgive them for leaving, and admit your love for them. And it's reciprocated. A blissful moment quickly torn apart by the ever-present infection suffocating your world. Only the infection doesn't claim your life, just your partners. Suddenly you carry the weight of a cure to this ferocious infection on your shoulders. Your survival is now paramount to the revival of humanity, meanwhile you watch friend after friend die to help you survive. The guilt must be extraordinary. Riley, Tess, Sam. All lives lost along the way. Meanwhile, she's accompanied by a man she grows to care for despite his past wrongdoings. She chooses to avoid judgment in favor of needing someone to be there for her. And even he tries to unload her like baggage that can be easily tossed. But he doesn't. You choose compassion and understanding. You get him to admit that he cares for you and you continue along your journey. But he becomes injured as bandits attack to take someone else from you. With no other option, you kill everyone in sight to save your lives. You kill anyone who pursues you. You fight hordes of infected to get resources to save his life. And you put yourself at risk to get the medicine he needs. A risk that gets you captured by a cannibalistic psychopath. Once again, you're left with two options. Fight or die. For a long time, I read the end of Winter as she brutally slices through David well beyond death as her response to the disgusting deeds he had in mind for her. While I do think that plays a role, I sense something deeper. Every instance that Ellie is forced to kill a living person shakes her to her core. The first time she kills a non-infected human, it's to save Joel's life. There is no room for debate. He was dead if she didn't shoot him, and so she does. She's clearly rattled by it. But Joel still being emotionally mute has no comfort to offer. Anytime she sees Joel execute someone, she'll shout things like, Jesus, Joel, indicating her strong discomfort. Her body count is very low going into the end of fall, but it quickly racks up dozens of kills depending on the player's ability to be stealthy. Ellie's fundamental truth is that she cares about life. Her life, Joel's life, and the lives of people around her. Though she will fight back if cornered, she wants nothing more than to keep Riley's words at heart. To fight so she can spend more time with those she loves. The amount of blood on her hands by the end of winter, both direct and indirect for those like Tess and Sam, becomes too much for her to stomach. That's why she's so uncharacteristically detached as spring begins. The one long monologue she offers is a nightmare about being on a plane full of screaming people. It's careening downward with no pilot at the helm. She desperately tries to save them, but knows she can't fly a plane. She's helpless to stop their inevitable doom. This dream is representative of the lack of power she feels to save those lost, and the responsibility she holds for the lives she's taken. The weight of this burden causes her to deny Joel's offer to return to Tommy's place and forget about the cure. She says firmly that all of the lives lost to get them here, the things she's done, they have to be for something. She needs it all to have meaning. And Joel? Joel only needs what he's needed all along. To survive at his level of comfort, 
a standard that now includes Ellie. <laughs> Ellie nearly drowns as Joel is knocked unconscious on the outskirts of the hospital. He wakes up in the hospital, greeted by Marlene and another Firefly. He learns that Ellie is okay, but is being prepped for surgery. The cordyceps on her brain have mutated and can be used to reverse engineer a vaccine. An end to this infected nightmare. But as Joel is fully aware, the fungus can't be removed without killing the host. Despite being told to leave or die, Joel chooses option three. Shoot Firefly Grunt in his manhood and demand to know where Ellie is. He tells him, and it's up to the player how you get there. Be stealthy or massacre your way to the operating room. I promise you, Joel doesn't care as long as he makes it in time. When you arrive, the surgeon tries to stop you. Fat chance, buddy. The player is even given the option to make sure the other two don't interfere by putting them down. What do you think Joel would choose? At this point, he fully seizes control from the Fireflies, from a player who might not agree with his actions, and from Ellie. The last line of defense is Marlene, who proposes he knows Ellie would be willing to give up her life for a world without infection. No more lives lost. She even offers him an out, a get out of Firefly territory free card. Just leave the girl. His response? Whether Ellie resents it or not, her intuition has helped guide her to still be alive at this point. Joel's proposed story that there are dozens of other immune people who have done no good in finding a cure is flimsy at best. So she confronts him. She tells him about all the guilt I alluded to. One last time she makes herself vulnerable and admits how awful she feels about the lives that were lost to get them here, both indirectly and by her hand. And then she asks him straight out. Swear to me. Swear to me that everything that you've said about the Fireflies is true. I swear. Watching Joel squirm in response to Ellie's guilt over those lost words as he grabs the watch Sarah gave him and says, I struggled for a long time with surviving. You keep finding something to fight for. Confirms everything we, and likely she, already know. Joel prioritizes self-preservation above all else. That is, until someone else becomes as important to his standard of living as himself. His selfish motivations claim countless lives at the hospital and an unimaginable toll of a world without a cure. He is a monster from start to finish. As Ellie accepts his lie, she takes on her share of this burden. The power of this ending always lies in its ambiguity. Does she know he's lying? If she doesn't, what will the consequences be when she finds out? If she does, why does she accept it? Maybe it's Riley's words coming back again. Savor every moment you have with those you cherish, because this unforgiving world has no sympathy for you. Before the sequel likely gives an answer to these questions, this leaves the debate to us. The entire game poses the question, how will humanity respond when backed into a corner? Taking an overview of Joel's actions, it's hard to pretend he isn't a ruthless murderer. At the same time, there's a part of me that can't help but sympathize with him. What would I do if I was in his shoes? Would I simply lie down and accept my fate, or would I fight back? Would I fight back enough to survive, or would I want more? And if I found someone that I cared for in a world that doesn't care for me, would I give them up so easily? How about you? For me, there's no easily reconciled answer. I can't have my cake and eat it too. I would want to protect my life and those I care about without bringing harm to others. But as is well illustrated across their grim adventure, this world doesn't offer that luxury. That's what continues to make the characters and narrative of this game so compelling. This conundrum makes me empathize so much with Ellie's struggle, but I can't fathom the burden of carrying the future of humanity on my shoulders. And while Joel may be a monster, his desires, even the negative ones, are relatable to the root of emotions we all experience. We are Ellie, and we are Joel. We are Riley, Tess, Marlene, Bill, Henry, and Sam. They are the last of us.